good morning, everybody. Uh, we're going to be in Luke chapter 22 today. As uh, Rich has already said, you know, we've got three more Sundays with uh, the McGee family here. Jake's going to be teaching the next three Sundays. So I really feel, uh, I really want to challenge everybody to make a commitment to try to, try to be here for the next three Sundays. I, I think that God is going to speak to our church through Jake uh, and I think it's just important to show our support for the McGee family for over a decade of service here to, to be here these next three Sundays. What was that other thing you wanted me to tell him, Jake? No, I'm sorry. Sorry. You know, I was thinking about we're at the end of the Gospel of Luke. We've seen all the events unfold. We've seen miracles. People raised from the dead and healed and blind eyes open and Lame people walk. And, but I think probably the final week of Jesus' life here on earth was probably the most emotion-packed week for him. I think Jesus' final week on earth was a roller coaster of emotions. I think it started out with great joy as he entered Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. It's what's been known as the triumphal entry. He sees the, the crowds amassed there, welcoming him, shouting in unison, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna. Joy turned to sorrow as his thoughts looked down on Jerusalem and he began to weep. And he said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I longed to care for you. If only you would have known the day of your visitation. What started with joy and then went with sorrow and then drifted into anger as he saw the charlatans there in the temple. And he drove them all out, the money changers, because they were making their father's house a den of iniquity. And that turned to anguish in the garden of Gethsemane as he sweat great drops of blood. And he said, God, if there's any way, let this cup pass before me. Nonetheless, not my will, but your will be done. A flood of emotions. But I think it kind of crescendoed in some ways there in the upper room with his closest friends, the disciples. Probably a mixture of of emotions flooding his soul. He knows what's going to happen. He knows what they're going to do to him and for how long. He knows what he's going to suffer. He knows what they're going to go through. He knows the gaping hole and void that's going to be left after he ascends to the Father. So he has feelings of intimacy with his closest friends. The final meal, he said, I long to eat this Passover and I won't eat it again until we celebrate it in heaven. And then those emotions gave way to sadness because of Judas' betrayal. And he said, I know the one who will betray me. The one who dips his bread and eats it will be the one. And then probably just the, the need for patience with Peter. Because Peter said, I'm your boy. I'm your guy. You can, you can count on me, Jesus. And, and Jesus said, Peter, Satan has desired to sift you like wheat but I've prayed for you. I've interceded for you. I'll protect you. He said, Peter, you don't realize what you're saying. You think you won't deny me? You'll deny me three times before morning. What a flood of emotions. Still, Jesus' final week is full of encounters with people. We've, the past two weeks, seen Jesus encounter two people. One was a bent-over woman held captive by demonic activity where she couldn't even raise erect, stand erect. Jesus' encounter set that captive free. And last week we saw somebody just on the other end of the spectrum, the rich young ruler. The woman was old and he was young and she was probably poor and he was rich and she was invisible and he was influential. Two people of the opposite spectrum and both had an encounter with Jesus. And today we're going to look at one final encounter Jesus had. An encounter with the Apostle Peter. Jesus is going to step into Peter's darkest hour. I couldn't help but think as I sat on the front row singing that song, the lyrics that, that we sang, and I thought, Peter could have sung those songs. You stood before my failure, eternity into your, in your hand. What can I say? What can I do? But Offer this heart, O oh God, completely to you. That would be Peter's prayer after Jesus steps into his darkest hour. So look with me. In Luke chapter 22, we're going to begin reading in verse 54. It's describing the scene and the events 
the final events in Jesus' life. And speaking of Jesus, it says, Then seizing him, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. And Peter followed at a distance. But when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter sat down with them. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, This man was with him. But he denied it. Woman, I don't know him, he said. A little later, someone else saw him and said, You also are one of them. Man, I am not, Peter replied. About an hour later, another asserted, Certainly this fellow was with him, for he's a Galilean. And Peter replied, Man, I don't know what you are talking about. And just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. And then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And Peter went outside and wept bitterly. Jesus wasn't the only one about to die and be buried this night. In a very real way, part of Peter died that night too. Not in a tomb of wood or stone or marble. Peter died in a tomb of failure. A tomb of failure. Many people were changed by the resurrection. We saw secret disciples boldly come and ask for the body of Jesus. The, the, the disciples on the Emmaus Road were changed, and it says fire was in their chest after an encounter with Jesus. The, the disciples who scattered later would become heroes and pillars of faith, unwavering in spite of the odds. Many people were changed after Jesus' resurrection, but none were changed more than Peter. First for the worse, and then for the better. Peter was a man filled with good intentions. Like I said, he promised Jesus that last night there in the upper room, even if everybody else leaves you, Lord, I won't. Even if I must die, I will never deny you, Jesus. And just a few short hours later, the cock crows. And Peter's eyes meet Jesus' eyes. Can you imagine how devastating Peter's failure must have been to him? Imagine the devastation. Peter's denial of Jesus wasn't just a single mistake. It was really the consummation of a life filled with mistakes and filled with failures. Peter's life was filled with good intentions. He lived the life of a man who had good intentions but lacked the power or the ability to carry out those good intentions. In other words, Peter was just like you and just like me. We all have good intentions. We all start out so strong and so determined that we're going to make changes in our lives. We're going to stop doing what we know we shouldn't. We're going to start doing what we know we should. We're going to become the people we've always wanted to be but never could. It happens every January 1st. And it lasts until about noon. We all have good intentions. And Peter was just like us. But give Peter credit. Because there, after Jesus is arrested in the garden, Matthew tells us, then all the disciples deserted Jesus and fled. And even after the others fled, Peter tried to keep his promises. It says that at least he was following at a distance. But he was still following. You know what? A lot of people follow Jesus at a distance. There's some insecurity in them. There's something intimidating about getting close to God. There's something about following Jesus at a distance that seems safe and seems natural. It seems easier, but it isn't. The easiest way to walk with Jesus is right beside him, as close as you can possibly get. And yet people want to admire Jesus from afar. They want to call him a great teacher, a prophet, a good man. But they deny that he is God. Don't follow Jesus from a distance. Peter found himself in a courtyard where Jesus was blindfolded, ridiculed, mocked, beaten, and scourged. That scene never left Peter's memory for the rest of his life. It was etched in his memory. He carried it with him everywhere he went. He knew what he was, ta what he was talking about when he said in 1 Peter 2, when they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he trusted himself to him who judges justly. 
This was no secondhand version of the events that night that Jesus was betrayed and arrested. This was a firsthand viewing. And in that garden, as he sees this scene happen, and he sees them beating and mocking and ridiculing Jesus and, and putting thorns on his head and pulling out his beard and doing all these things, and Jesus never retaliated. And in the midst of all this, as he sees it unfold, Peter is asked, weren't you with Jesus? And Peter denies even knowing him. He's asked a second time, and then for the third time, the question is asked again, Weren't you with Jesus? And we're told, Peter replied, Man, I don't know what you're talking about. And just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. And then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him before the rooster crows today. You will disown me three times. And he went outside and he wept bitterly. I often wondered, what was that gaze that Jesus gave him? You know, that look you can give your parents, that look you can give your children. That look you can give your spouse communicates things silently, those who know you the best. But I don't think that Jesus' glance was a, a look to scold Peter. I don't think it was a look of disappointment. I think it was probably more a look of understanding. The Bible says God remembers that we're just made of dust. We're so weak. We're so frail. Even with our good intentions, Even with our determination, even with every ounce of strength that we have at our best, we're weak. So Jesus looked understandingly, but still, Peter saw in Jesus' face the pain that betrayal probably caused him. And that's probably why Peter wrote later in his life, In your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer for everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Always be prepared. First of all, you have to have that hope. Second of all, it has to be manifest somehow that people recognize it. But for goodness sake, be ready with an answer if anybody says, what's different about you? Peter failed bad. But you know, I can't get down on Peter too much because I've denied Jesus many times under much less drastic circumstances. We all have. That's why I identify so much with Peter at this moment. We all feel those those moments of failure and disappointment and discouragement. We're all ready to give up. We're all ready to say, what's the use? I can only guess what went on in Peter's mind for the next three days. Can you imagine the anguish that he went through? Can you imagine the grief that he suffered? Can you imagine the remorse he was feeling? You know, that helpless, helpless feeling of knowing you're not able. There's nothing you can do to fix what you've done, to take back what you've said. There's nothing you can do to resurrect that failure. Jesus had called Peter the rock, and Peter discovered the rock was cracked. The one hope that Peter had in life was now dead. Jesus' death, in some ways, was Peter's death. The death of Peter's hopes and his dreams and his future, his whole life fell apart because the one he gave his whole life to was now dead. And not only that, as crushing of a burden and weight that would be, you add on top of that the weight and burden of his failure, knowing that not only did he deny Jesus, but he did it in front of Jesus. So what do you do after such a devastating failure? You know, when you've cried so long, you're numb. What do you do after you've replayed your failure over and over and over in your mind? Do you think Peter could ever get that picture out of his mind, at least in the first three days, every time he closed his eyes, seeing Jesus' face as he turned to him? What do you do after you can't think of any more names to call yourself? That's where Peter was, his darkest hour. And all alone for the next three days, Peter went through a kind of death and burial. Peter didn't need encouragement. He didn't need a pat on the back. He didn't need to be reassured, it's okay, Peter. He didn't need encouragement. Peter needed a resurrection. He needed new hope, a second chance. Peter needed a miracle. I say he was all alone because Peter's once close group, the apostles, 
the disciples, those who knew Jesus best, were now shattered. The group was gone. Among his friends, there had been cowardice, betrayal, and even a suicide. The group is scattered like sheep without a shepherd. And then one morning, three days after Jesus was crucified, some of his most most faithful followers, a band of women, decided to go to Jesus' grave, probably not knowing why, not knowing what they were going to do once they got there, other than bringing some oil to anoint Jesus' body. They didn't know what the morning held. Their hopes were gone too. They felt like failures too because they abandoned Jesus just like the disciples did. And even if they didn't abandon him physically, they've abandoned him hundreds if not thousands of times in their thought life, in things they've said, in things they've done, in relationships they've had. But that one morning as they went to the grave of Jesus, they were met there by an angel. And listen to what the angel said to these faithful followers. Don't be alarmed, the angel said. You're looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him, but go tell his disciples and Peter. He's going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Go tell the disciples, but especially Peter. Sometime later, all the disciples return to the lives they they lived prior to meeting Jesus. I don't know if Matthew went back to being a tax collector, but certainly the fishermen went back to fish. John tells us that as they were gathered together on probably the Sea of Galilee, if I remember right, Jesus appeared to the disciples one day. It says that they've been out all night fishing and casting their nets, and they caught nothing. It's the only true fishing story ever told in life. And as they're out there bringing their nets in and headed for shore, they see someone there on the shore. And they see the smoke coming from a fire. And as they strain to look, they gaze to look and see it's Jesus. And all you hear is a splash. The minute Peter knows that Jesus is there, he plunges into the water and he swims ashore. And there over the fire, Jesus is cooking fish for breakfast. So I can imagine how awkward that meal was. How would you like to have a meal with the one who you betrayed and denied? The one that you've beat yourself up over. We don't know how long it's been, but it's been a while. And they're trying to engage and they're trying to eat a meal and Peter's probably feeling really uncomfortable and really awkward. But the longer he eats, the more comfortable he feels. And probably at the end of the meal, he leans back and he says, Jesus, it's so good to have you back. What Jesus says to him is remarkable. But what Jesus doesn't say to him is even more remarkable. In spite of his failure, in spite of his denial, in spite of his weaknesses, in spite of his all empty empty promises, Jesus didn't say, some friend you turned out to be, Peter. What a failure. You're all talk, Peter. Thanks for nothing. No, you know what Jesus said? Peter, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than these? Do you know that every one of us are going to be asked that question one day? Every person who's ever lived in the past, present, or future is going to find themselves before Jesus one day, and he's going to say, who did you love the most? Did you love me more than these? It's the most most important question we'll ever be asked. Do you love me more than yourself? Do you love me more than your job or our career? or the lifestyle, or wealth, or pleasure, or popularity. Do you love me the most? And Peter says, yes, Lord, I do love you. And we're told that Jesus repeats the question three times, once for each of the three denials. And these three questions undoubtedly remind Peter of the three other questions he was asked, there by another fire, standing around a bunch of strangers, asked three times, aren't you a friend of Jesus? And so as Jesus asks him this question three times, it reminds him of his failure. And after hearing the same question three times from Jesus, it says Peter became grieved. But Jesus is not there to inflict pain. He's there to relieve it. He's there to lift the pain of regret that Peter was carrying and would carry the rest of his life 
unless Jesus did something. Peter could have remained a failure for the rest of his life. People would say he was disqualified because of his denial of Jesus. He would be ridiculed. Historians tell us that the rest of Peter's life, when he would walk into a new town or a crowd of people, that his enemies would make the noise of a cock crowing. Throwing his failure in his face. Reminding him of his darkest moments and his deepest denial of Jesus. He could have remained a failure for life, but Jesus came out of the grave on a search and rescue mission. The resurrected Christ came to the shore that day to resurrect Peter. Jesus said to Peter what he said to all of us failures. Follow me. Follow me no matter what you've done in the past. Follow me no matter how many times you've failed before. Follow me no matter how, how you feel about yourself. Peter was given another chance. And with a new beginning, after a terrible failure, the words of Jesus to Peter changed him from a failure into a success. And the historians bear out the fact that something happened to this man named Peter. Just 50 days later, God calls him to deliver the gospel message in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. 50 days later. You know what God didn't say? Peter, you're going to have to earn your way back into my good grace. You're going to have to prove yourself to me. Yeah, we'll go through this maybe for a year, year or two, and, and if you're faithful over that time, then I'll start doling back a little bit of grace, a little bit of responsibility, a little bit of opportunity. I'll restore your calling. I'll, I'll embrace and, and endorse you to people once again with my anointing and with my spirit. And Fifty days later, who spoke on the day the church was born? Peter, fully restored. Tradition tells us that Peter was asked many more times in life, are you a friend of Jesus's? And each time he answered with a resounding yes. And one time they asked Peter that question and they were holding a cross in their hand that he would die upon. Crucified upside down. A martyr for the faith. Peter died later in life, but he was resurrected long before that. He was resurrected the day that Jesus met him there on the shore and restored to him the relationship that he had thrown away through his denial. You know, in a very real way, Christianity is just not about or not just about the resurrection of Jesus. It's about the resurrection of Peter and John and Thomas and Saul and you and me. That's what Christianity is about. It's about resurrection. It's about the resurrection of people whose lives have been filled with failure. For days, until he had an encounter with Jesus after his resurrection, Peter had been a troubled man. And as I was writing this message, I thought there's going to be troubled people here today. Troubled over your past, troubled over your present, troubled over your future. People who need forgiveness for past failures people who need power to live life in the here and now, people that need hope, blessed hope, to look ahead to the future. Jesus' resurrection meets all those needs. It solves the past failures, the present life, and the future of eternity. And that's why Jesus said, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go there and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you may be where I am also. We sang about that today too. Don't let your hearts be troubled. He said, you know the place where I'm going. And we do know the way because Jesus told us. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. This story, simple as it is, teaches us so many things. It reminds us that God's love is not dependent upon our success. We have this concept that says that, that when we're good, God loves us, and when we don't, God is angry with us, and that couldn't be anything further from the truth. God's love truly is unconditional. He said, I have loved you with an everlasting love. 
It reminds us that God's not surprised by our failures. Remember, Jesus predicted this failure. It didn't take him by surprise. But you need to believe one thing. God loves you on both sides of your failures. He loved you before you failed, and he loved you after you failed. God's love doesn't ebb and flow. God's love doesn't come and go. The third thing it teaches us is God is bigger than our failures. Peter thought he threw his ministry, his life, his future away. And 50 days later, he's speaking at the inaugural message of the inaugural gathering of the church of Jesus Christ. David, the psalmist says, If the Lord delights in a man's ways, he makes his steps firm. Though he stumble, he will not fall, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. God's bigger than our failures. Another thing we need to learn from this message, and this is an important one, God still uses failures. God still uses failures because we're all failures. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. We are all failures. As far as we know, Peter never again denied Jesus. And Jesus again used Peter to profess himself and to birth the new church. God still uses failures today. We need to decide if our failures are going to be temporary or final. Everybody here either has, is, or will consider giving up, of quitting, saying the demands of Christianity are too great. The life is too difficult. There's so much I can't do and so much I want to do but don't, and what's the use? I failed so many times. I want to tell you something. You're never, ever a failure until you quit. You're never a failure until you quit. The proverb says, though a righteous man falls seven times, he rises again. And this example that Jesus gave us is just that, an example for all of us. So when you find a failure, restore them. Don't punish them. Don't fix them. Don't try to correct them. Don't rebuke them. Restore them. Paul told the Galatians, Brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently. But watch yourself, or you also may be tempted. One of the greatest disappointments I have in life is seeing the way Christians treat failures. They kill their wounded instead of restoring them all along forgetting that they're as big a failure as the person they're trying to fix or rebuke or to correct. And the last thing I saw in this story, and I just saw this this morning, when Jesus said, Peter, do you love me more than these? You know, that can mean two things. Do you love me more than you love them? Or do you love me more than they love me? I mean, that reads both ways. And both are applicable because you've got to Love Jesus with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength, full devotion. But you know what I think he might be saying? Do you love me more than you love them? Because there's going to come times that they're not very lovable. And I want you to still love them, not because they're lovable, but because you love me and I love them. And I think if you look at Peter's life, he probably lived that way for the rest of his life. John, come on up. This whole message is intended and designed to remind us that we're all failures, but to remind us that God resurrects failures, just like he resurrected Peter. So the next time you fail, the next time you feel like giving up, the next time you want to throw it all in, chuck it, walk away, remember what Jesus does with weak failures. He loves them, he forgives them, he strengthens them, he restores them. In other words, Jesus, the resurrector, will resurrect failures, which means he'll resurrect us. Let's pray. Father, all of us have felt the sting of failure. And sometimes it stung our ego. Sometimes, Lord, it messes up our plans. But, Lord, when we fail you, There is no remedy outside of you. 
We desperately need forgiveness and mercy and grace. God, we thank you that those three things are offered to us new every day, countless times a day. So for the people in this room right now, God, that are feeling like giving up, I pray, God, that you would resurrect their faith, resurrect their resolve. Let them be determined to be fully devoted followers of you. And for those who aren't, we will. And when those days come, I pray that you would do the same. Father, we thank you for your resurrection. We thank you for the resurrection of Peter, and we thank you for our own. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.